All right, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna continue talking about blood pressure today <clears throat> and, uh, and how that relates to our overall health. Um, last time we talked about how we have two numbers when we talk about blood pressure, your systolic blood pressure and your diastolic blood pressure. These are two different values. Um, the way we write them, we write them down as a fraction. Okay, so your systolic is gonna be on top, your diastolic is gonna be on the bottom. The way we measure this is through millimeters of mercury, um, MMHG. That's how we write it. Um, <clears throat> so our, our systolic is always typically going to be a higher number than our diastolic. And we'll talk about it a couple times later on um, when the, we'll actually see a narrowing of these values. We actually will see a systolic maybe come up or go down and see a diastolic either come up or go down, and we will see these numbers kind of narrow. As it stands right now, if we use the normal 120 over 80, <clears throat> that gives us 40 millimeters of mercury difference, okay? Remember that, because we'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> the average systolic range is 100 to 140. Average adult diastolic is 60 to 90. Now, <clears throat> when we say average, every person is different. The, you know, we have parameters of which we class, classify as normal, but understand that your normal may look a little different depending on what kind of health, overall health you're in. Um, if you're an endurance athlete or you're a, a, just an athlete in general, we can probably anticipate you having a lower <clears throat> um, blood pressure than say someone who lives a very sedentary lifestyle. Now, when we talk about abnormality in blood pressure, we are talking about high and low. We're talking about high blood pressure. We're talking about hypertension or a hypertensive crisis. <clears throat> and uh, there's people take medication for this. Um, it can be either systolic or diastolic or way above norm. Or we can have what's called a hypotensive crisis where we have a very low blood pressure. Now, uh, high blood pressure is just as bad as a very low blood pressure. So if you, if you encounter a patient that has a relatively very, very low blood pressure, we gotta try and figure out what's going on. Typically there's a, a, vo a volume loss there, um, a, a fluid shift somewhere or losing blood somewhere. <clears throat> so we need, we need to think about that. You know, we do have medications that we can give um, which will which will try to stop either the 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 escalating blood pressure or the dropping of the blood pressure. <clears throat> A lot of factors can increase blood pressure: age, uh, gender, blood volume. Um, we'll talk about that definitely when when we deal with trauma. Stress: How much stress you're under. Pain, if you're, if you're experiencing lots of pain, this can also affect blood pressure. Um, exercise or lack thereof, weight, race and diet, all these play a role in, in blood pressure. So there's a lot of factors here that can, uh, that can uh, impact blood pressure. <clears throat> a lot of things we need to consider and take into account when we're talking about why someone's blood pressure is extremely high or why someone's blood pressure is low. Okay, and we need to try to start ruling out things if, to try and figure out if they are hypotensive or if they are hypertensive. So when you look at a dial of a blood pressure cuff, you see the numbers, they are, they are marked off in, a, in, in two tenths, so therefore it's impossible for us to have an odd number if we're using a manual BP cuff, okay? So I sh when, you're, when we're doing blood pressures or when you're taking blood pressures, I should never hear the blood pressure of 123 over 75, okay? Because with this style of BP cuff, you can't get that value. It's impossible. But even if you say, well, it, it, was, it was in between the lines, just round up or round down. Um, the only way to get odd numbers on that are to use a Dynamap or, or some sort of electronic um, uh, BP cuff. Okay, which many clinics, hospitals use them. Sometimes they use the ones that go on a wrist. I know my dentist's office, actually, when they check my blood pressure, they, they put it on, uh, on my wrist and have me put my hand, uh, my arm across my chest. So 
With those, you can get odd values, but with a manual BP cuff, which we'll use in this class, uh, you, you, uh, you will never get a odd value of that, okay? Guidelines for measuring blood pressure. Do not take blood pressure on an arm with an IV, a cast, or a dialysis shunt. Um, this, this should go without saying, if they have an injury of some sort on that arm, do not, do not put a, a blood pressure cuff on that, please. So, um, so just, just, just be aware of that. If the patient has a dialysis shunt, from where they uh, receive dialysis, do not put it on there. It, 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 can, it, it can impact that dialysis shunt and you can do some uh, harm to your patient. Um, with an IV, well, we, if, we're, if, we're take, if we're taking a blood pressure, it's compressing those, the, the vessels and stuff in there. And if we're trying to um, take a blood pressure in that arm, then we could we could actually stop the blood pressure. And so it's, uh, it's something that we need to also think of. Now, if you have a patient that has uh, bilateral IVs, say in a trauma patient, then yeah, we're, you know, we're still gonna take it on, on the arm because we, we have no choice. So we have two IVs in each arm. So you know, we're gonna have to do it at some point. So it, that's fine. But if you have a patient with an IV in one arm, and they don't have an IV in the other arm, just use the arm that they do not have an IV in. <clears throat> um, do not take it on side where a, a patient has had a breast surgery on. So if they've had a mastectomy, um, do not take blood pressure on that affected side. Um, it carries a, a risk of uh, lymphedema that, uh, that can swell the lymph nodes. So we wanna try and really pay attention to that and make sure that uh, that we're not doing that. Now, if they've, have a, if they've had a double mastectomy, then we're ju you're just gonna have to take a blood pressure on one arm or the other, okay? But let's, in, if, if at all possible, let's try not to do that. <clears throat> Measure blood pressure with the person sitting or lying. Typically, your patient's always gonna be sitting or lying, okay? I very rarely have I ever taken a blood pressure with a patient standing up. Typically, they're gonna be in a sitting position unless they're experiencing some sort of mercy where they have to be lying down. Okay, if that's the case, then just take it lying down. And we'll talk about a time here coming up here in just a second where we'll actually do both. And it's called an orthostatic vital sign. Apply the cuff to the bare arm. Do not apply the cuff over clothing. Now, this is in there. <clears throat> I, I didn't make this, this presentation. This is one of the few I did not make. Um, that's that's not necessarily true. <clears throat> I've taken I've taken blood pressure over clothing before. We need to take into account if you're trying to put it over like a big you know down jacket or something like that. Then yeah, where where it's not going to be effective. However, if they have like just a long sleeve shirt on, long sleeve button up shirt, um, and it's still rel the relatively thin clothing, you can still take it through there. That's that's not going to have any impact in there. So let's, let's try to look at it and see how thick is that clothing. <clears throat> if, if it's thick, then we wanna try and, and, uh, and do it to where we can get it on the bare arm. But if they're just wearing like a dress shirt or um, say a t-shirt that has long sleeves, I can still do it over that. So I'm not concerned about that at all. Make sure the cuff is snug. We don't want the cuff falling off. Um, when, 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 if the patient puts their arm down, okay? But necessarily we don't want um, it to be super, super tight because as you start pumping it up, that cuff inflates. And as it inflates, um, it could break away from the Velcro connecting it. And then it, that, you know, we can't take a blood pressure like that. So we want it snug. Use a large cuff if necessary. We can change out cuffs. Um, we have, um, we have pediatric cuffs. We have newborn cuffs we have um we have extra large cuffs and it was called thigh cuffs so we we have different cuffs that we can use okay we're just not we're just not standardized to one cuff okay so we can't switch those out if need be and you have a if you have a patient that is obese 
um, that's extremely obese and their arms are too large for the standard cuff, then yeah, we can actually put the thigh cuff on the arm as well. I've, I've, I've done that many times. Make sure the room is quiet. In an ideal utopian setting, sure. However, um, in medicine, that's not always the case, especially if when practicing emergency medicine. <clears throat> um, you just gotta know what you're listening for. And once you know what you're listening for, it becomes a lot easier to, uh, to, to determine what a blood pressure is. There's very few times I've taken blood pressure where the room is extremely quiet. You know, I've done it, people are yelling and screaming because it's, it's following a shooting or something like this. <clears throat> but um, you just got, you, you know what you're listening for and, and you're here. Now, there could be some problems where if the patient has a very quiet blood pressure, then yeah, it might be a little difficult to hear. Um, and sometimes, especially in an emergency setting, I might have to wait till I get to the ambulance in order to listen to Oscar take that blood pressure. Okay. Um, so that, that might be a possibility as well. But typically, it's, you're, you're going to hear something. If you do not hear the blood pressure, wait 30 to 60 seconds and try again. If you still cannot hear it or you're unsure of your readings, have a nurse or someone check your measurements. Have your partner check it. Okay. If, if we're talking about paramedics and EMTs, um, you know, you, you're, you're always with the partner. Have them, if you're just not sure, have them verify. Hey, listen, bud, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing this. I'm not sure what I got. Can you, can you try? Try, try it in a different arm. <clears throat> you might, you might get a, you might be able to hear it at that point. Um, uh, reposition your stethoscope in, on, on the arm. You, maybe you just don't have a good, uh, uh, you're not in a good place to, to hear the, the brachial um, thumping. So, so uh, th there's different ways to get around this. <clears throat> Procedure for measuring blood pressure. Clean the stethoscope, your pieces, and diaphragm with the alcohol prep. Um, if it's your stethoscope, you necessarily don't have to kill, uh, clean the earpieces, but definitely clean the diaphragm with alcohol, um, especially if you're putting it to every patient in the world. So just, especially in this age of COVID. So just clean the, the, the bell, the diaphragm um, with, uh, with alcohol. Locate the brachial pulse. Brachial is there in the, in the bicep you know, in, in the humerus area. So we're gonna feel the brachial pulse. And the stethoscope is actually gonna be placed in the break of the arm, which is known as the antecubital. All right. Wrap the cuff around the elbow with the arrow pointing to the brachial artery. <clears throat> On the blood pressure cuff, there is a, there's markers inside the cuff where it says artery, or there just might be a line or two lines in there. Make sure that that's over towards the middle of the arm. Make sure you attach the cuff snugly. So once again, it does not fall off if the patient happens to straighten their arm out, okay? Because this will also give you a false reading. So it needs to have a nice snug fit. Place the diaphragm of the stethoscope flat on the pulse site, holding it in place with the index finger and middle fingers of one hand. Use whatever fingers you want. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> Just make sure you get the stethoscope in the break of that elbow. Okay, um, locate the radial pulse. You're gonna come down, you're gonna feel for the radial pulse. Make sure the valve on the blood pressure cuff is closed all the way. Because if you start pumping and it's not, you're gonna get the uh, leaking of air out and you're never gonna be able to properly inflate that cuff. Inflate the cuff till you can no longer feel the radial pulse. Okay, so, so I have my fingers on the radial pulse. The blood pressure cuff is up on the, on, on, on the bigger part of the arm, the bicep. And I'm going to pump out the blood pressure cuff until I can no longer feel that radial pulse. And then I'm going to inflate the cuff around 30 millimeters of mercury beyond this point. So for example, if I'm feeling the radial pulse, I start pumping it up, and I no longer feel the radial pulse at 100 millimeters of mercury, I'm going to pump up blood pressure cuff to 130, and then I'm going to start, I'm going to slowly open up that valve, and I'm going to slowly start to release that air in, inside that cuff. Okay, now, if that, if that valve is tight, <clears throat> you may actually over, you may open up the valve too much where all the air just leaves immediately. And then you're going to have to seal it back up and, 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 and re-pump up the, the blood pressure cuff. 
okay remember this is this is in a utopian setting okay i i can tell you this as a paramedic i have never felt for the radio pulse and then uh pumped my blood pressure cuff 30 millimeters of mercury okay i i typically i'll put the bp cuff on i will pump it up to 200 and then i'll start to release it that's just that's how i've done it that's how i do it um this is how it's the the quote unquote proper procedure for doing it okay as the saying goes there's definitely more than one way to skin a cat so um i have my own different way of doing it every every paramedic has their own way of doing different things whether the medic or an emt deflate the cuff slowly by opening the valve slightly and turning it counterclockwise <clears throat> with your thumb and index finger sometimes it takes a little bit of practice to get used to that coordination of slowly opening it up allow the air allow the air to escape slowly while listening for a pulse sound now we're going to talk about how you get the systolic and your diastolic findings. The first, so after you release the valve and you're watching that needle go down, once you hear your first thump, 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 that is just systolic blood pressure. So the first time you hear the thump, that is, just, that is your systolic. You're going to continue to hear that thump as you keep slowly deflating that cuff. And you're going to hear thump, thump. Thump, thump, thump. When you no longer hear the thumping, that is your diastolic blood pressure. So once you hear the first thump, that's your systolic. When you no longer hear the thump, that is your diastolic. Okay? These, this is how we get those two readings for the blood pressure. <clears throat> All right. So um, once you once the thumping has gone away and you got your diastolic value, just open up the valve all the way and release the rest of the air in the blood pressure cuff. Mm -hmm. If you are unsure of what it is, and in the beginning, it might be a little odd for, for you to, uh, to do this and listen and watch the, the blood pressure cuff at the same time. So you may, not, you may not initially get your systolic right away, but if you're in a position where you're just not sure, ask someone to, 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 to verify your findings or, if you need to redo the blood pressure, you have two options. You can wait one minute before rechecking that blood pressure in that same arm, or I can remove the cuff, I can put it on the other arm, and I can immediately do a blood pressure on the other arm, okay? So uh, you do have a couple different options here of attaining the blood pressure. <clears throat> Patient assessment. Patient assessment is one of the most important skills you will have as a healthcare provider. It doesn't matter if you're a paramedic, an EMT, a nurse, a physician. Having a good patient assessment is, is vital to figuring out what could be going on with this patient. All right, so uh, in the EMS world, we use an acronym known as SAMPLE, okay? Um, S stands for signs and symptoms. A is for allergies. M is for medications. So the entire time I'm asking the patient, do you have any allergies or medications? Okay, first of all, I'm gonna ask, hey, uh, so if I arrive on scene, and I approach the patient, hey, uh, my name's Chris, I'm here to help. I'm a paramedic, um, what, what's going on with you today? And the patient states, oh man, my, my left side is really hurting really bad. Okay, um, and then from there, that's gonna take us to a different set of uh, readings, which I'll, I'll talk about here in just a second, okay? So if the patient is complaining and talking about pain, Here's how this is going to look. <clears throat> as soon as I ask, what, what, what's going on today? And they say, man, my, my side is really hurting. Then I'm going to go into what's known as OPQRST. Okay? OPQRST. This is, this is our, our, our pain descriptor. So, okay, now my next question is, okay, when did this start? What were you doing when, when you started feeling this pain? <clears throat> They're going to answer me back. And then I'll say, okay, what makes this pain worse or better? Does anything help it? After that, I'm then going to ask him to describe the quality of the pain. Is it a sharp shooting pain? Is it a kind of a dull pain? How, how, how is this pain? Can you describe it in your own words? Does the pain radiate? Does it move from the side up to the back between the shoulder blades? Um, because sometimes you'll have pain 
in the back that will actually shoot up in the shoulder blades that this can actually be indicative of gallbladder um, issues. Okay, so we need to ask, does this pain radiate? And then I'm gonna ask about the severity of the pain. A pain, it, it, I'll ask the patient, on a scale of one in 10, with 10 being the worst pain you ever felt in your life and one being hardly any pain, where does this rank? <clears throat> Time, how long has this been going on? Okay, so this is, this is OPQRSTs when we're talking about pain. So after I ask the, the patient about the signs and symptoms, <clears throat> and they tell me, oh man, I'm having pain here, then I'm immediately gonna go to my OPQRST chart. Okay. Then after I get done with time, I'm going to re reassume the, the history. Okay. Now I'm starting back at allergies because I already asked the signs and symptoms. They told me they're having pain. So I did my OPQRST. Now I'm going back to my, my sample chart. Okay. Allergies, sir, ma'am, do you have any allergies for any medications, um, insects, anything like that? Um, are you currently on any medications, whether it be prescription or over the counter? <clears throat> Do you have a past medical history? What conditions have you had in the past? Okay, this is, this is important to ask because there are some things that, that they may tell you in their past medical history that could be um, good clues to help you figure out what is going on in this current condition they're in. When was the last time you ate or drank something? Okay, the last oral intake. So I, I need to try and figure this out because if they're experiencing pain and they've been having nausea and vomiting, you know, when was the last time they ate something? It could be food poisoning or it could be gastroenteritis, uh, which is basically the stomach flu. And what events were leading up to this? Well, what were you doing um, when, when you started experiencing this pain? Okay, so um, events and onset are, are, are similar in nature. Um, so, you know, you may, you just may be asking the patient to, to reiterate themselves and that's fine. Okay. Let's make sure that, that we understand what they were doing when they started feeling this pain. Okay. So once again, I'm going to start with sample when I start talking to a patient. However, once they start telling me about their signs and symptoms and pain involved, then I'm now going to OPQRST. Okay. <clears throat> Pulse pressure. The difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. All right, so if we're talking about if we're talking about uh, the normal, the normal. Um, let me bring up my whiteboard here. I'm talking about my my normal one twenty over eighty. Okay, there is forty millimeters of mercury difference there. Okay, between the 120 and the 80. Now, there are some medical conditions that could actually bring the systolic down to where it could actually narrow with the with the diastolic blood pressure. Okay, so I could have I could see a reading of say 108 over 80. Okay, it's zero. Okay, so <clears throat> once again, this this is narrowing. It, we could see it even closer. We could see a patient having one 100 over 80, okay? Now we're talking a difference of 20 millimeters of mercury, okay? We could see even dive even sharper. We could see 90 over 80, okay? Now, now when I start seeing this, this is really concerning because they are bleeding out somewhere. Somewhere they are losing volume. So somewhere that they're causing, something's being caused or something's causing um, these values to narrow. All right, so we need to try and figure out what, what that cause is. Go back to the PowerPoint. <clears throat> so once again, how you determine the pulse pressure, you subtract, you, you subtract the systolic blood, blood pressure from the diastolic blood pressure. This will give you your pulse pressure. A reduced pulse pressure is a marker of reductions in stroke volume. Okay, so something we need to understand here. <clears throat> We're talking about stroke volume. It's the amount of blood that is being um, 
pushed out into the body with each contraction, okay? So, there are different things that impact stroke volume. So, if we have trauma and we have a patient that is bleeding out into their abdomen, into their belly, this is going to have a negative impact on stroke volume. Okay, I may see your pulse increase, but what's going to happen to the blood pressure? The blood pressure is going to decrease because blood pressure is related to stroke volume. Okay, volume. If the volume is low, then we can anticipate the blood pressure being low because remember the blood pressure is monitoring how much blood is being pushed throughout the vessels at each contraction. So for losing volume somewhere, we're losing blood that's be, that could be uh, contracted through the, through the body. The heart recognizes this. So what the heart starts doing, it starts beating faster to try and compensate for a low volume. Okay, so this will increase our pulse, but drop our blood pressure. <clears throat> so we see a reduced pulse pressure in the marker of reductions of stroke volume and may allow for early identification of volume loss because of hemorrhage. If we start seeing that narrowing pulse pressure, we need to start thinking there's a volume loss somewhere, okay? If we see what's known as a sharply narrowed pulse pressure, <clears throat> um, that is indicative of a, of, a, of a condition known as cardiac tamponade. And I'll talk more about that here in a second. So let's go back to the whiteboard here and clear that. So <clears throat> say we take a blood pressure on a patient and I get, say, 84 over 80. This is an extremely narrow blood pressure uh, or pulse pressure. This is telling me that the patient is probably dealing with cardiac tamponade, okay? So, okay, what tamponade is telling me is, and I'm gonna draw a beautiful heart for you, okay? This is exactly, this is anatomically correct. That's what the heart looks like, okay? So, we have four chambers in the heart, okay? And you have a pericardial sac around the heart, okay? So what's happened is something is causing blood to leak into this area right in here. And now what's gonna happen is, <clears throat> depending on what, what side the injury is at, we could actually We can actually see the pericardial sac here, and we can see it start filling with blood here. What happens is this blood starts putting pressure on, on the heart muscle, okay? So as it's putting blood uh, pressure in it, because all this is filling with blood, it's pushing this heart in. So basically, so if this is the left ventricle, the left ventricle pushes the blood through the rest of the body, right? So if this area is filling up with blood, but not this area, all right, that's going to reduce our stroke volume because this chamber should be filling all the way, but it's not. It's only filling up some way because you have this blood pushing, collapsing that chamber in. You know, does that make sense? So now, so the, Think of a, uh, a Ziploc bag. Say you have a, a, uh, <clears throat> a sandwich Ziploc bag and you fill the whole thing with water, okay? That is your normal left ventricle. Now, empty the water out, take half of that bag, crimp it. So, so close the bottom part off and then just fill that top part of the bag up. That's effectively what's going on with cardiac tamponade. You're not getting the same amount of blood volume into the heart to be pushed out to the body. All right, so when this happens, this is decreasing our stroke volume. This is a deadly condition. This has to, you have to do what's called a pericardial synthesis. The needle has to go in and get all this blood out, okay? So 
whenever we see a sharply narrowed pulse pressure, we need to start thinking about cardiac tamponade. When you talk about a widening pulse pressure, this is indicative of a syndrome known as Cushing's triad, which tells us about um, increased intracranial pressure if they have a head injury. Okay, so let's go to our whiteboard once again. So if I take a person's blood pressure and I get 140 over 70, okay, <clears throat> the value here is what, 70, right? So 70, 70 millimeters of mercury difference, okay? Now, say five minutes later, because they're a critical patient and they have a head injury, I take it and it's 170 over 70. Now this is 100 millimeters of mercury difference. Say I take it again and it's 190 over 70. Now that's 120, okay? I'm seeing a widening, I'm seeing a widening of the pulse pressures, okay? This is indicative of intracranial pressure, ICP, okay? Basically, the brain is swelling. The brain is swelling. And, and so we need to, first of all, this, this patient needs emergency care like now. If not, then they're going to what's called herniate at the base of the skull. So if we have a skull, I'm trying to do my best skull drawing. Okay, at the base of the skull right here, we have an opening where the spinal cord goes down. Okay, it's called a foramen magnum. Okay, as the brain, which sits all inside here, as the brain begins to swell, it has no place to go because we have the protective cranium, we have the skull. So it's not allowing that brain to swell except one area through the foramen magnum. This is called herniation. So the brain will slowly get pushed down until the brain stem, which controls your life processes, breathing and all that stuff, until it gets pushed down through that opening. Once this happens, this is fatal, um, that this will result in, in death, all right? So whenever we see an increasing pulse pressure, we need to think, ICP, intracranial pressure, okay? Once again, this is known as Cushing's triad. Not Cushing's response, there, there, there's a difference. This is Cushing's triad. <clears throat> we will see the hypertension. We'll see the increased blood pressure. We'll see the decrease in breathing, okay? And so uh, this, this is all indicative of ICP, okay? Widening, widening pulse pressure and decrease in breathing. You may also see some uh, different respirations patterns we'll talk about later when we talk about head injuries. Okay, it caused Shane Stokes and, and Biats and uh, stuff of this nature, okay? Tilt tests or orthostatic vital signs. We can also take blood pressure from, uh, blood pressure from a patient sitting up or lying down. So what we do here is <clears throat> we can actually have them uh, this shows it. Uh, this shows them on a on a table. I don't. I couldn't find a good. Um, I did make this part of the PowerPoint. I couldn't find a good picture of them doing orthostatic vital signs. So basically, what you can do is you can have the patient standing up or sitting up. You take the blood pressure. <clears throat> you can have them. You then take them lying down, or you can take it lying down first and them sitting up. If you see a shift. <clears throat> If 10 millimeters of mercury, or in, in some cases 20 millimeters of mercury, that means that they are, it's a positive tilt. There's a fluid shift somewhere going on. They're either severely dehydrated or they're losing volumes from somewhere. Okay, so a patient with a volume deficit will experience a decrease in preload, stroke volume, and cardiac output. So let's talk one second about preload. clear this. <clears throat> so once again, we have our, we have our anatomically correct heart. We have our four chambers in the heart. So preload means that in between each contraction, this fills up the blood. 
This is your left ventricle. All right, so this whole area fills up with blood and this blood is then pumped to the rest of the body. Okay, so this is preload. Now, things affecting preload can be like I previously mentioned, cardiac tamponade, um, congestive heart failure, stuff like this. This, anything that limits, anything that limits this whole area from filling with blood, okay? So if, say, this area is cut off and we can only fill with blood this part, okay, this is gonna have a negative impact on, on preload and stroke volume, right? because it's, it's hindering the amount of blood we can get out to the rest of the body. This, at some point, is going to cause hypoperfusion, okay? <clears throat> if the systolic blood pressure decreases greater than 20, mill 20, uh, 20 millimeters of mercury, or the heart rate decreases by a greater of 20 to 30 beats per minute, from the lying down position to a standing position, the patient said to have orthostatic vial signs or uh, postural hypotension. Okay, if a sudden drop of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury in the systolic reading is found when assessing blood pressure, note the phase of respiration. If it occurs during the inspiration, during the inhalation part, then it's, in, uh, it's indicative of what's known as pulsus paradoxus. Okay, we'll talk about that here in just a second. <clears throat> and pulsus paradoxus can be seen in, car in, like, in cardiac tamponade, pericardial effusion, um, pericarditis, and pulmonary embolism and cardiogenic shock. And when we talk about shock, we'll talk a lot about cardiogenic shock, okay? So basically, um, pulsus paradoxus means that there is, a, there is a visual difference between being during um, standing and sitting upon the inspiratory phase. So when they're breathing in, you're seeing the blood pressure drop, okay? It's not a constant drop. It's only when they breathe in. You breathe in, we see the, we see the blood pressure drop, okay? This is pulsus paradoxus, okay? And then once again, this is indicative of several cardiac issues, and we need to be very aware of it. They could, typically, it's either going to be one of, one of three things, cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, or PE, or cardiogenic shock. It could also be uh, indicative of a tension pneumothorax, which is basically a collapsed lung. Um, and that class song could be putting pressure on the heart and it will shift the trachea over. All right, so um, that actually concludes this part, which is perfect. And from here, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some things. I'll have some uh, activities for you to do online and then um, we will delve into uh, another unit. All right, so um, I'm gonna stop it there. If you have any questions, remember, fill out the Google form ask questions, and then what we'll do is we'll have a very short uh, um, connect time where people who have questions, people who need uh, clarification on things can ask, okay? And I'll let you know when that will be uh, later this week, all right? I hope you all have a great day, and I'll talk to you all soon.